I always try and look at the blessing and the curse. And having been diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis has been my greatest teacher. I feel like I'm just this sensitive barometer. So I, I feel things a lot more intensely than maybe somebody who doesn't have this diagnosis, but it also keeps me in line. It keeps me being open to listen to my body. Hey friends, Dr. Motley here and welcome to the Dr. X podcast. I'm your co-host, Dr. Motley, and today we have a very spe special guest, Jessie Golden, and she has a plethora of awesome information out there. She is the author of The Golden Secrets. She's been on many podcasts, many more than I can count on some huge podcasts. She herself has a great following on Instagram and social media because she's been seen as a person who dives into many aspects of health, not just um, what you eat, but also what you put on, how you put different colors around you, the people you're around, the energy you're around, and you can see that she is multifaceted and not just a one-dimensional person. Jesse, thank you so much for joining us on Dr. Axe's podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I love that little intro. Oh, you <laughs> know what? You. I'm getting better at the intros. I'm trying my best to get <laughs> That was good. <laughs> I, I think that... Um, they, they've told me like, you know, you need to, you need to step up your game, Dr. Molly. We'll see what's, you know, what's going on there. But again, thank you so much for, for joining us. Um, for many of you who may not, but I bet you, you guys know who she is in the natural health world. Um, your page, you can tell has so much great information out there and you've written through your articles. Um, we want to get to that totally. And we want to see how you have given advice to many about health. Um, but we really want to know about you. I think this is a great avenue to start because people love to hear the story and then it can show how much you can be an effective uh, person in their life as they go to your page and experience what you have. So tell us a bit about yourself. And we want to talk about your journey through your health crisis, through your autoimmune. So please uh, take the floor, Jesse. So I'll start in the beginning. I um, grew up in Chicago, Illinois. My mom had a dance studio. So I grew up as a dancer, as a ballerina. And I love sharing that story because looking back after I got diagnosed, that was part of my healing journey as well. Growing up as a ballerina, you really learn to ignore all your body's signals <laughs> through um, repetitive movement and discipline. Um, you, you really have to just kind of push through to strive on top of that. You're also trying to achieve this epitome of perfection that does not exist. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people don't realize, unlike a lot of other sports, the ballet room has a mirror, the size of the entire studio. So you're able to judge yourself the entire time. And then the teacher is also judging you. So it, so I'm just setting up the stage because what I noticed later on in my life is that I had a very uh, negative inner dialogue. I was constantly judging myself. Mm -hmm. um, but I grew up in Chicago. I actually became a vegetarian when I was 11 years old. I'm no longer a vegetarian. I do want to preface that, which we'll also get into. But I became a vegetarian at age 11 um, in the 80s, which was so unheard of to the point where in Chicago, like my grandmother said, you're going to die if you don't. <laughs> you know? Like, that's how crazy it was. But, you know, I made the connection at 11 that I was eating these animals that I loved and I just could not do it like empathically. So I did it because I just couldn't I couldn't register um, eating animals. And I was like, well, I could survive without doing this. So why would anybody not do this? Mm -hmm. And I really went on this bandwagon of being this vegetarian at a very young age. And I joined PETA and I was very aggressively having conversations with people at the dinner table. And I was a force to be reckoned with. I am not like that anymore, but I was very I had a lot of energy, a lot of chi, as you would probably oh, say, yes. a lot of vital force energy when I was a kid. So I was ready to, to fight the battles. Um, but um, I, I was always, I noticed ever since I was a kid, looking back, that I was just drawn to these kinds of things that were considered a little abnormal. I spent a lot of time alone. I knew right away, having been in the dance studio, that I also needed to balance that time by myself. I liked being alone as a child. 
I guess looking back, it was almost a form of meditation, even though I didn't know I was, that's what I was doing. Um, I was always drawn to nature and trees and animals. And these kind of have become my tools as I've gotten older and throughout my life. Um, so I, w- I felt like I was really the epitome of health. I was a ballerina. I was a vegetarian. I was doing all the right things. I eventually moved to California where I was a regular at uh, Ron Tea Garden, <laughs> like getting all my herbs and doing all my things. The first air one, you know. Really? Um, and then I had... Yeah, I was like one of the first Aeronians, like sitting at it was still Ron Tea Garden. I don't know if you know that. Yeah, you were, yeah, from, where you, yeah. yeah, just drinking reishi all the time. Oh, and, you know, I love so it. I thought that I was, you know, I really, I was always fascinated with this holistic way of doing things. And I loved the people that it attracted. I loved the energy that it attracted because I was always very sensitive to harsh environments and harsh people. And it, it kind of goes hand in hand. Um, and I had my, I got pregnant with my son when I was 25. I, I gave birth the, the Khalsa way through Kundalini yoga. I gave birth at home naturally mm-hmm. breastfed. So I'm doing everything, you know, that I thought was right. And the crazy thing is, is when my son was four years old, so when I was 29, my body started to just not feel right. Mm-hmm. Something was wrong. And going back to my ballerina ways, you know, you, you, you push through it. You don't ever stop. You just keep going. You push through it. You ignore your body signals. And of course, as we know now, if you ignore those body signals, those whispers are going to become screams. And, you know, I went from doctor to doctor to doctor. And everybody would just kind of look at me and, you know, be like, you're fine. I went to homeopathic. I went to regular doctors. I went to uh, Ayurvedic doctor. I mean, I went everywhere. And not until I thought I tore my Achilles tendon um, chasing my son at the park, I ended up in the emergency room. And the doctor in the emergency room's mother had rheumatoid arthritis. And she saw my knuckles, which were visibly kind of black and blue. Mm -hmm. Um, which again, I ignored, I was kind of used to just being in pain, especially I was a single mother. I do want to preface that I was a single mother. I was breastfeeding. So I always kind of had an excuse as to why I was tired. And she guided me to go see a rheumatologist. And that's when I was, you know, given the diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis, which, you know, as embarrassing as it is, I had no idea what that was, Mm -hmm. you know? Um, And I think a lot of people think of rheumatoid arthritis, like osteoarthritis, instead of an autoimmune disease. And they and, don't realize it like, really, like many times they do mix the two up and they have completely different sets of uh, symptoms if you're not used to what that means. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, my natural way was, well, I want to go this holistic route, you know, and this was 13 years ago. And my family was like, well, you know, this is like not something to mess with. And my rheumatologist said, if we treat it aggressively, you have a higher chance of going into remission. And I was scared. I was in a very, very vulnerable place. Um, So I did do what my doctor had told me to do, which she put me on methotrexate, very strong immunosuppressants to basically kill your immune system to hopefully stop the inflammation and the damage from happening in the joints and the pain. I, of course, always have to do things to empower myself. So straight away, I looked at my diet. What can I do? You know, and you can easily Google these things now, but it's like, okay, there's certain things that are inflammatory, like nightshades, dairy, meat, alcohol, coffee, you know, a lot of those things I had already excluded from my diet. But I really honed in to try and empower myself through my diet. When you did that diet, when you started, you, know, you already were, you know, eliminating some things. Did you find like um, when you did that, what were, like what were the top things that you found? Was it like, uh, or do you remember back then, like was it dairy or, or grains or uh, that really made a big difference in your pain levels? You know what? I wasn't eating dairy. At, I don't think I was eating dairy at that time. Anyways, if I was, it was very, uh, very little, very, very, you know, infrequently. I think the main thing for me was probably sugar. Um, 
You know, but what ended up happening as a busy mother, and I think this does happen to a lot of people, I didn't, at the time, I didn't have the tools. And I was so scared that anything I put into my body was going to create more inflammation. So I really don't think in the beginning of me doing this elimination diet that I was getting enough nutrients. Is that what they play like with now? Like you see that the tools that it's helped you propelled you to give tools to other individuals saying like you don't have to give up every single thing if you start to understand your body or more aware that's yeah a hundred percent and i think you know the biggest thing that i've learned about myself throughout this journey is that i am unique and i have an individual constitution that is unique to myself and my ancestry and my environment and this diagnosis that i was given And the craziest thing is, is it's ever evolving because there's been times in my life where I was like, oh, this works for me. But at a certain point, it would stop working. Mm -hmm. So then I would have to reassess and be like, you know what? It's a different season. There's a different reason. I'm going through a different phase of my life. Maybe it's time to try this now. So I think remaining open to the fact that we are ever evolving and we're always, you know, moving forward and being open to new ideas, um, which is kind of why I wanted to preface that I was a vegetarian most of my life and then I was strict vegan. And I think because of the values that I had based on that, my ego would not let me listen to my body when it was wow. like. <laughs> That's a good yeah. point. That- when okay so when okay so back in just a bit i'm saying like in going into the ego like you focus like on your bio individuality and about how people are unique in themselves about how they can break down certain foods and there's phases um and many of the individuals out there realize that they can have a uh, soreness or something that starts to dissipate and then you know in a couple of months out they'll start to feel sore again and i think it was really good like on the podcast uh, that you've been on, like I remember you talked to Dr. B- Zach Bush, and you were talking about different aspects about not only mental health but uniqueness. Um, and then you say, well, that leads into you starting to understand and be aware of not not only let's say uh, what bothers my stomach, but also like you say your constitution. Like we know in Ayurvedic and Chinese medicine, you start to see what organs are stronger in certain seasons. Is that like in those kind of aspects? And so you've gotten the tools to give people because I see that in your in your writings as well. Now I'm saying like when the ego's involved, now you know these things, and so the ego starts to prevent you. I want you to expound on that. I just want to give people a little about that bio uniqueness you're talking about. But yes. Yeah, I mean, I had made such a stance. And I think anybody that has a voice and has something to share does this in their life. Mm -hmm. And I think it's so important to not hold people to it. Like Mm -hmm. it is okay to change your mind when you are presented with new information or ancestral wisdom. Like it's okay. You know, I've written an an entire book and 98% of it, I still stand by, but there's a couple things in there that, that no longer work for me. They might work for you, Mm -hmm. but that's that's what I try and teach people is I I have learned through living with this chronic disease that I have to be open and adaptable to change and listen to new ideas. Like th- that's the coolest thing about the environment that we're living in right now is we're being fed so many incredible ideas and it could be the simplest thing that could make a shift for you. That is amazing. It's true. I love the way you talk about like literally having the capacity to change from all the things that you would think you believe you set that in your neurology. Like this is the only thing that's going to make me feel good. You start to feel worse. You can get stubborn. Your ego can get in the way. Say, no, we have to open and accept that. I Do you find this when you're working with clients here, people that call you sometimes you yourself as a practitioner, can get stuck into that. You can almost go, no, I think this is going to work all the time. And then you go and hear another practitioner tell you something that's revolutionized a whole set of like healthcare with even Chinese medicine. And I, I find it humbling, but I do love it that whenever I find new information that it only reinforces, it doesn't tear things, but it reinforces me to change. And I, and we have to in healthcare, anybody out there that's listening that has rheumatoid or autoimmune, you know you have to change at certain points. You can't stay static when it comes to treatment. 
And I think, you know, I always try and look at the blessing and the curse and, you know, rheumatoid, having rheumatoid arthritis, having been diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis has been my greatest teacher. One of my greatest teachers, because just what you said, like it keeps me, I'm, I feel like I'm just this sensitive barometer. So I, I feel things a lot more intensely than maybe somebody who doesn't have this diagnosis, but it also keeps me in line. It keeps me being open to listen to my body. And no matter what, like what, no matter what diet you're on, no matter what podcast you listen to, no matter what doctor you go to, the bottom line is you have to listen to what your body's telling you. And then maybe explain it to the doctor and be like, no, but this is what's happening when I do this or when I do that so that they can help guide you. But I think I always go back to tuning in with everything that I share that has been my, one of the greatest lessons throughout this disease is like just tuning in instead of seeking outward. Definitely. Like whenever you, when you seek and find out and become more aware, I'm asking um, when you say it becomes your greatest teacher. So many out there that are listening right now, have gone through some hardships like you have and have really chronic infections. Um, and I think it would be very tough for individuals to see, like you say, these were, these can be viewed as stepping stones as hard as it can be. Like when you learn about who you are and when you started, when you, when you became in that, you know, that, that realization in your life, like this is propelling me to do something uh, to help other individuals in your heart, like when was that, uh, I guess the feeling, when do you knew, like, I have to take this, this, what I have, make it a stepping stone and realize that I can help other individuals. And, and in essence, it would help me too, myself. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. So at the exact time that I got diagnosed was a really interesting time in my life. So I was, I was actually making a living as a model. I made a living as a model pretty much my entire life. And I was still modeling at the time. I was 29 and I had just gotten my yoga certification. And it was at the same exact time that all these yoga companies were just coming to birth. Mm -hmm. And as a model, I really stood out because I was one of the few models that was an actual certified yoga teacher. So I was able to book a lot of these jobs just because I was, you know, my agent was like, when they would say, does she do yoga? Actually, she's a teacher. And they're like, oh my gosh, she's a teacher. Because back then nobody was really, everyone was like, yeah, I kind of do yoga. You know, it's not like it is now. This was, you know, 13 years ago, almost 14 years ago. So a lot of these yoga companies gave me a stage to tell my story Mm. because I was not the face of rheumatoid arthritis. People associated rheumatoid arthritis with somebody old and crippled. And here I had been, I kind of skipped part of my story, but I did get really, really, really sick before I got better, which go through that. Yeah. You got really sick before you got better. Like, yeah, I really, I know those symptoms, but what were you like? Some of the the things that really got you your attention. Yeah. So, so after I tried, um, you know, all the, all the medicine that my rheumatologist wanted me to try, I, I, I decided to stop. I, I, I knew I wasn't going to do that for long because I figured in my brain, you know, living with a chronic disease, I think that's kind of where allopathic medicine does not serve us, you know, because we end up in this vicious cycle. And what happened with me was the medicine was kind of covering up the symptoms, but then I was getting side effects of the drugs that was making the line very blurred for me. Like, what are the side effects of the drugs and what are the symptoms of the disease? Like I, I couldn't even see clear anymore. So I finally got my friends and family support, which I desperately needed because I was a single mother. And I was like, if I'm going to try this holistic route, I'm going to need support, which in itself was a learning curve for me because I'm not used to asking for help. Uh-huh. So that was very humbling. And it's interesting. I think that's a common thread with people that, you know, have chronic disease is learning to really, ask. For I can help. ask it. Not trying to like when you find it. And there's individuals that come to the office, and me myself, I've had I had chronic Lyme for a long time. And the one thing that my friends would uh, I say accuse me of was that you didn't really tell us that you had that for the longest time. And how did you not know? It's like, well, do you believe? I'm asking like for those who are out there listening that 
uh, many times we take that energy upon ourselves and that could be, you know, from our environment, you are a single mother, you had a lot of stress, or it could be like, you know, as well as genetic, you know, you could have genetic markers that had RA in there, but there is something, isn't there, that people think we can take care of ourselves and then we can block out the outside world. And, and I read a really great article guys. Okay. About harmonics. And, you know, we talk about homeopathics. I won't go into it because maybe it's a little too nerdy for everybody out there and they want to hear it. But it's saying that the longer we let something perpetuate and allow that frequency to exist in our tissue, it actually builds harmonics. You build waves, consistent waves, and it actually builds in our tissue to create physical matter because the energy can't escape. So it actually gets compressed. And so it compression and it's energy. And I was like, we individuals, like I'm talking with you, Jesse, like, you know, I'm going to take care of this thing by myself. And I'm like, oh, goodness, that perpetual thought could build up and express itself in physical sickness. I went through that route just saying that what we think can really change our physicality. I wish I had been told that um, back then because it's still it's still a tough lesson for me. Still, I, you know, I don't like putting the burden on people and. You know, it's a whole thing that I have, I am still actively working on. Um, But, you know, my body at that point had gotten to the point where it was shutting down so dramatically that I had no choice but to do the work and asking for help was part of that. So talking about like physically, so a lot of people that don't know this, but rheumatoid arthritis is systemic. So it can affect your entire body, not just your joints. It can get like your heart, your eyes, your lungs, your teeth, like everything. I had gotten to the point where I was completely bedridden. I could kind of get out of bed, maybe around like four o'clock. Um, but I was walking like you would imagine, you know, a hundred year old person walking like my, like the Tin Man, like my any synovial joint would just not bend. Like it would take me, you know, 15 minutes just to get my arm to my mouth to brush my teeth. So everything was just, the only way I can explain it, it felt like everything was broken and it was complete torture because again, I'm coming from being a ballerina where my entire life I expressed myself through movement. And now I'm being forced to literally be still with myself and my thoughts. Wow. And I think that that's the way it had to be for me to learn the lessons I needed to learn. <laughs> like, let's explain. Like when you say having to be still and, and I also want to think about the self judgment too. Remember you're in a room full of these mirrors, you have self judgment. Yeah. I'm, I'm thinking with you. I'm not, it's like, I have to move. I have to express myself. My value is in this. And maybe your body may have known in the future that I had to sit still and then become aware of who, what was going inside. I mean, that could be an aspect of it, but it's, it really is like when you say I have to sit still, because many people out there that have chronic infections, you're right. You ignore your body. I'm telling you dancers, ballerinas, anybody that's in, um, like I have uh, patients that came in the other day and they are ballerinas and literally like they have the worst ankles and hips that I've ever seen. And it's almost to the point, like, I'm like, why do you keep doing that? And it's just an internal drive that keeps them going. Yeah, they can't stop. They can't, they would literally probably die if they stop. Like it's part of them. Now, how do you feel like you say now you still have, like, you know, you're pretty, you know, not asking for help, pretty hard on yourself in that a- aspect when you were getting methyltrexate and then your parents like and your family was supporting you, did it, did it take you a while? Like how long did it take you to tear down that wall and then finally just jump in and say, I'm going to do this myself and do some natural health and, and take charge of it. I mean, did it take you a while or did you just sort of like flip the switch and get going with it? It took a couple months. It was like, I almost had to prove to my friends and family that that wasn't going to work so mm-hmm. that they would support me on this quest to heal myself naturally. That's what I would say back then. Um, And, you know, I had just finished my yoga certification and, and the blessing in that was everybody that was in my yoga certification knew a guy. They had a Yatsu guy. There was an Ayurvedic guy. I went to a Chinese medicine doctor. I I had a guy from Mexico bring healing clay that he would put on my joints. I mean, I had a guy for everything. And it was like, 
send them over, send them over. Like I was willing to try everything. So I was like, if I'm going to live with this disease for the rest of my life, I'm going to do everything in my power to see what is going to work and not actually make me worse, you know, in the long run. Because as you know, those medications that are, you know, recommended, a lot of people don't realize, but there's certain drugs, which I'm sure you see commercials for all the time now, like Humira and Remicade, they're called TNF blockers. And they're really the only drugs that stop the progression of the disease. And that is one, what, like stop the damage. So stops the progression of the disease and the, the damage. So for me, you know, 13, 14 years later, I have said I'm thriving with rheumatoid arthritis because despite my disease and despite how I may feel on certain days, I choose to thrive. It's a constant choice that I make to move my body and stay ahead of the game and do things that I feel like are going to make me feel better, whether it's mm -hmm. the quality of food, the people I hang out with, my environment. And, and like I said, I'm this like, really, I'm like a barometer. So I need to be very careful because things show up in my body instantly. That's what we're, I want to touch on that. And just, I want to touch about your empathic, the empathic feeling that you get from others and how they express it. But I, I think you made a great point in, in that when you had to have a guy, like a, I know a guy, that, that amount of information <laughs> that you accumulated to see in, in your, like this worked, this worked for me, this did not work for me, that must have created a huge data bank in your heart and in your body to be able to express it now with Instagram, with social media, Facebook, these things. And, and, I, and I have to say that like the people who suffer, who go through the illness, and find out the remedies or, you know, are able to live with it and able to thrive with it. You are put through that so that you're able to like express it to others and it builds a community. And like we're, I'm sort of jumping out ahead, but I want to talk about how it built your community because they, then people know you can identify. Cause when you look on your social media guys, you gotta check it out. You can see that she can feel what people feel like. It's almost like you, she reads ahead uh, with her posting. <laughs> But empathic, like you say, like you could feel like you become a barometer with this uh, infection. Many people out there probably identify with you and say, yes, uh, so sensitive. How did it feel like when you got around, uh, maybe I'm going down the wrong route, but I'm saying like when you got around somebody that was um, not the best energy or something that was not like, do you pick up on that really, really effectively like in your empathic body? Yeah. I mean, I knew I was an empath like since I was young. I don't think I had a term for it. Um, but like I said, I, I, I would spend a lot of time alone, um, just because I, I felt I would often feel depleted being around people. Like I get my cup filled by being by myself. So I'm more of an introvert. Um, and something that's really interesting when I was on my healing journey, one of the main things that I did, um, to begin with was macrobiotics diet, which talking about energy and the food of, and the energy of food and just the energy. Like I had this macrobiotic counselor that basically designed out my whole life when I was going to eat, what time I was going to eat. Cause it was associated with certain organs of the day and the time of the day when I was going to walk, when I was going to do ginger scrubs, when I was going to do, um, uh, you know, douching to, um, every single part of my day was regimen to get my body to heal, to go from acid to alkaline. And on top of that list, it was refrain from TV, refrain from crowds, refrain from like excessive and loud music and stuff, because I feel like this is something really profound too, that's happening right now is people don't understand that if you go around a really heavy or dense or even expansive energy, your body is then going to crave heavier or denser, denser foods just to balance out what you've been going through. Well, that's good. I'm, I'm good. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, because I was eating so clean and they wanted me to stay on this healing diet, that's why they wanted me to you know, be very mindful of who I was spending my time with, which made so much sense to me. I was better able to, 
to stay on my diet. Had I, you know, been around a lot of like, like negative energy or something. Oh my gosh. I I don't think there's any way that I could have. And that is one of the other blessings in disguise. It happened in the beginning of motherhood. I think a lot of women finally get the the cahoots to stand up for themselves and their energy because they don't have much to give after they have a child. Um, But anybody that's going through a chronic disease, if it's, if you're not feeling better around somebody or an environment, that's a sign. (laughs) It's truly like when you say like being able to eat lighter, you know I mean? Like, or eating like clean and regimented, being a little bit of, you know, an introvert, it allows you not to have to weigh your body down. And so it can still be free flowing. Now, this is, this is like, it hits me in the head too. That makes sense though. When, um, for any, for anybody that's gone through, like we say a cortisol rush, when people are very sick and we know this, that cortisol will actually pack on a lot of weight and your body will actually, if you're not careful, like you'll have cravings, of course, because any resonance with a person that comes into you, your body will naturally try to put up a defense mechanism. And one of the biggest impedance or one of the biggest stops to a lot of waveform is extra matter. So like, you know, that makes sense. Like you probably would naturally want to like put on more weight if you had negative energy all around you. And I, I think people don't realize that. I think seriously, thicker the flesh the harder it is for a wave to get into the system and in effect organs. And they talk a lot about that in like defensive chi, like wei chi in, in Chinese medicine. And I, but not to t- like, I really love that fact. So anybody out there is like, it motivates you like in them too, they're listening. They're like, you do need to try to be free and to have more movement and to eat something that's for your body type and for who you are. Now, when you realize that with the crowds, like you had to be, you, you're an introvert and people don't think that I'm an introvert, but I'm, I'm a bit of a, a little bit of an introvert. Myself. But um, when, when you realize that, that you're an antenna, like you doing yoga and you having a platform now, like they love and you're, you know, you do modeling, you're out there. How, how hard was it for you then to take your knowledge, put it out there and then expand on it. Because if you're a natural introvert and you feel people's emotions, how hard was that? Or how'd you, how'd you progress? You know what? Social media is the perfect tool for an introvert. (laughs) It really, it's, it's so interesting because I have a 17 year old son and he could care less about social media. And sometimes I try and explain to him the positive sides of it. Like, how often I used to have to go out into the real world. Like for instance, when I was modeling, I would have to go to uh, you know, a hundred different castings and go sees and auditions. And now you can basically do everything from the comfort of your own home. And you have more um, control over what you put out into the world. Mm-hmm. You know, as a model, I didn't have a say as to what I was wearing, what I was doing, what I was saying, what I looked like, like nothing. And so social media for me, when it first came to birth, I was like, oh my gosh, I can tell my story. And when I started to share my story, like I was saying, kind of through those yoga brands, my, this was actually before Instagram, my inbox, I I believe it was Facebook, um, blew up to the point where everyone was asking me, how did you do it? They were seeing these images and pictures of me you know, when I was at my sickest, I was down to like 90 pounds. And like I said, I wasn't walking, I looked horrible. And then all of a sudden I'm on like the cover of Athleta magazine or, you know, or athletic clothing and yo and aloe yoga and all these things. People are like, how did you do it? And I couldn't respond to everybody's messages and it would keep me up at night. But as a single mom, I was working, I had so much going on. I just physically could not respond. So that's when I started sharing I, I created the Golden Secrets blog like and I started sharing just the most common questions. These are nightshade vegetables. You know, this was 13 years ago. This is what I stopped eating. These are the things I'm drinking. This is, you know, um, the ma- a simple macrobiotics diet. This is, you know, talk about energy. I would talk about empathy. I would talk about parenting, spirituality, yoga, and it started going into like skincare. People wanted to know about skincare and beauty. And it ended up where I was writing every single day. And it became a passion project where, you know, I was never fulfilled as a model. Model for me, modeling for me was 
um, a ticket where I could have freedom and still be an, a, a mother, you know, uh, five days a week. Mm-hmm. So um, when I started my blog, I, w- I felt so grateful that um, I finally had a platform to share. And not only that, I think as a model, I was viewed as a model and a ballerina. I didn't have much of a voice. Mm-hmm. It was, you know, just dance or just look pretty. And I think a lot of people uh, didn't hear me mm-hmm. until I had this thing happen to me, um, which is why I say that it was a blessing. People started to, the walls came down and people are like, oh, she's human. Mm-hmm. She's going through something too. And I felt like the more I shared my real life, not what my agency or marketing was putting out there about me, my real life, the struggles of being a mother, the struggles of living with a chronic disease, that, you know, whatever it was, the more of a community I made and the more of a real authentic connection I made. And I was like, this is what I meant to do. Like this fills my soul and feeds me and, you know, makes me feel so good. That's when, you know, I get goosebumps just talking about it. it. Yeah. Goosebumps. I mean, like really when you see like uh, just the, the, the way that you've posted like your information. And I mean, like when we talk about the golden secrets, um, I want to like, just to, I just want to get a little, little top of that, like a little bit of the, uh, the uh, icing on the top. I, when you start to put that information out, the golden secrets, the cool thing is that when anybody out there has a chronic disease, the way that you present it is that you, like you say, there's, there's area for change because what happens I find with people with chronic infections is that they do get in a mindset, like it has to be this way or I'll never get better. And, and I have to stay this, this bound this much in my life. Now with your, the golden secrets, are there a few golden secrets that, I mean, just top one, two, three that stick out to you for individuals out there um, that you could say, like, these are the things that I, I love to, you know, live by, like something I remind myself I'm going through rheumatoid. Yeah. Yeah. I, I have a whole, th- I actually wrote an ebook on this five to thrive, but I'll give you my top three. Um, the only way out is in mm-hmm. tuning in. You know, I think that is one of the greatest lessons of chronic disease and pain. There is nothing like pain that brings you to the present moment and makes you reevaluate your life and what you're doing. And that is a gift. A lot of people are not given that opportunity to check in with themselves. Um, another one is stay as close to nature as possible in all things, the food you eat, the environment you're in, the, you know, where you spend your time, um, you know, grow a garden, have plants, you know, open your eyes to the sun, get some sun, go in the ocean. If you can, you know, roll around in the sand, like hug a tree. It matters. We're so disconnected from, we used to spend 90% of our time outside and now we're all indoors looking at blue light. And I really think for me, part of my healing is, it's, I have to be outside in the, like I, every single day I go outside, like there's no, you know, and I get, I expose my skin, you know, to as much as the sun as I possibly can. I mean, I'm grateful. I live in California, but take your sunglasses off, let your eyes open up, you know, ground, like, like grounding. I mean, grounding, like, get your like, shoes off. Like, yeah. I want to record. There's a great book. There's a few books on earthing. And I, and I've found that um, my patients that come in that have uh, rheumatoid and other autoimmune they, they they talked about in experiments about how uh, the uh, positive ions that have usually are attached to a lot of toxicities are pulled in the earth exchanges ionic charge through the feet and by like they hug a tree people are like what do you mean i'm like no there's a lot of ionic exchange from the static on your skin to a grounding carbon-based uh plant it's it's huge with with healing and that's great i mean yeah. that's a great thing to do And intuitively, it's interesting you talk about that because I live on the beach, so I'm always in the sand. And it's like instantly, if I'm having a stressful day, I'll go walk to the beach and I'm just able to give it to the sea. Like it literally just feels like a weight has been lifted instantly. And I feel like a lot of people feel that when they go to the beach, 
But right now with the energy of the world, I'm craving trees more than ever because they're so solid and rooted and grounded and wise. And it's like, that I'm craving more of that right now. Yes. Um, so I'm going to go get some trees. Um, <laughs> but the last thing that I wanted to share, which I think is so, is, is so easy to do when you live with a chronic disease, and that is to get into this state of being a victim, which can be a very toxic place. Um, I think it is very healthy to acknowledge that you're going through something, but if you sit in that, woe is me, it will eat you alive. So my, what my grandmother always used to say is look past your own eyelashes. So when you're having a really tough time, help somebody else out and kind of circling back to what you're talking about with me sharing on Instagram, it's a win-win situation. Because when I share, I'm able to help people, but my soul is filled and it makes me feel like living with this chronic disease is not in vain. It is a gift that I was given to help other people, you know, and share. I love that because when you see the aspects of how people are like we talked about so unique and bio-individual, um, when you can put that into books and to ebooks um how do like when they go to your website they can definitely download many of these things when they go to that can they expect i can hear from what we're talking about like you you're not uh pushy about like you have to do it this way or that way like for instance uh let's say supplementation uh you know i know many people would say like what i know the question people are going to say is like what supplement can i take and, and in my realm i go well we both know that uh it can depend on the genetic makeup of an individual if they can absorb certain nutrients better than the next person. Mm-hmm. So some individuals say, I want all my nutrients from cold pressed juices and I want it from my garden. I want it from this. And then there's other individuals. And we need to talk about this about like whenever you're vegan or vegetarian, there's other individuals that have genetic markers that allow them to absorb iron and they need iron because their thyroids need the iron in there. And so they need, they crave more red meat. And so their body actually thrives on, on those things. So when they go to your site, do, do, can they expect, I mean, I'm just asking like different plethora of different variety of like different types of diet plans, meal plans, supplement plans, or how do you like to approach that? Yeah. I mean, it's literally all over the place. I shared today, you can pretty much search anything on my website and an article will come up because I've been writing for, you know, 15 oh, wow. years yeah. now that, you know, I'm like, oh, I forgot I wrote that. You know, sometimes I'll just do a random search because somebody will be asking me something and I'm like, I think I wrote about that, you know, and I'll just search and it's like, sure enough, there it is. But to answer your question, everything that I've ever shared leads to me helping that person go within themselves where I believe all the answers lie and is unique to them. And I think that when you, we, we talk about uniqueness, it's, it's really crazy how uh, the micro uh, it can be in a sense translated by the macro in reverse. You know what I mean? Like you can think like uh, we say, well, everybody can't eat this type, certain type of food. And then in my heart, in my head, like I go into Chinese medicine, but I also love to go into genetics and I go, well, of course, like my mom's a little Korean woman. My mom can't eat uh, dairy at all. Like she has markers like, mom, you can never eat dairy. And I have, I have a heterozygous genes where I'm like, half of me can eat the dairy and half of me can't, can't <laughs> overboard, right? But you're right. Whenever um, there's a disconnect, though, that when individuals um, start to, if they don't become more aware, I'm not saying you have to get a genetics test, but when people don't uh, have a zeal to learn about who they are and such and try to go in and seek uh, the, the view, the outlook of the world gets very, very narrowed and then they can't, they don't see a way out. So do you find in my practice, it's, it's, it's been that way. It's like, if, if you can help a person like a teacher, if you can help guide them in the journey, it really does help your heart as a practitioner, a person to help others, you know, like, you know, writing for as many as you, as you have. And I love it actually forgetting if you wrote about it, you're like, yeah, I did write about that. That's really good. <laughs> Like, well, so much of it is like downloads and just release, downloads, release, like you're not fine. Of like, that's the body. like, does it feel like, I mean, with your guiding other individuals and helping them, um, do you feel like it's downloads? Like you just feel like things are just given to you, like you need to write about this to help somebody with this chronic condition. 
Yeah. I mean, so I can't sleep sometimes. Like I'm working on something right now where I'm like, get this out of my body, <laughs> you know? um, which is kind of how I was when I wrote my book. It was a lot of it, you know, I'm, I'm, obs- I am obsessed with information. I will tell you that. Like, it's really interesting because I was not very academic in school. I was very bored with the way that my school system was ran, but um, after school, it's like, I was diving into yoga and breathing and pranayama and Chinese medicine. And, you know, I will go down a rabbit hole on average twice a week, <laughs> you know, just like researching random Jessie, things. I can tell you she's, yeah. yeah okay. I'm in a rabbit hole. Uh, you know, so I am obsessed with information and I think that I, it's, it saves somewhere back here. Um, but then, you know, something will spark my interest and I'll get really inspired and I'll feel like, wow, this can help so many people, you know, and, and that is the, that is, I'm so grateful. You know, there's a lot of negatives about social media, but I always choose to focus on the positives and the positives are, I can write an article or share a blog post and it can reach thousands of people in a second. To me, that is mind blowing. And I do not. I do not take it lightly. I, I, I take very care with every single thing that I post and write because I do know that that has a profound impact on people that are seeing it That's and it can either make their day or not make their day. So I want to make their day. <laughs> I'm pretty certain you do. I think that uh, the information that just that your willingness to share makes people feel good in their hearts. Now, I know with uh, with Doctor Axis, his his uh, with his platform, the people will ask like, can't really narrow it down because we're all bio individual, but like putting information out there about like uh, like diet or juices or something like with rheumatoid or anybody has autoimmune, what have you like? And this is not trying to like you don't have to have a definite answer, but I mean like what have you found like food wise or uh, nutrient like vitamin or mineral? What's that's been like a couple top things you always found that really helped with your with your um, inflammation? I know it's a very broad question. Yeah, it's so funny too because I've gone through so many different phases, and I'm in a really different phase right now because which I've shared very openly um, on my Instagram. But I'm going through an IVF journey right now yeah. to have a baby at 42. So I'm mentally, I have been mentally and physically preparing my body to bear a child. So that has been my main focus. I've been putting on a little bit more fat on my body intentionally. I've been intermittent fasting for 13 years. I stopped intermittent fasting. Um, and I'm eating a lot of, uh, nutrient dense, real food, like grass fed meats. I'm actually drinking raw milk. Um, uh, all my vegetables I'm cooking instead of juicing to cook out any oxalates or anything that would create inflammation in my body. I used to be a big juicer and I noticed that it was actually it, it, at, at a certain point, it started creating negative effects. And I don't know if that was, you know, the oxalates in there or, um, you know, just the quality of soil, even though everything was organic, you know, it's, I feel better when I'm cooking my vegetables. So it's hard to say what I'm doing for rheumatoid arthritis right now, but the, I, w- I would say two things that, that, that I always do is, um, is make make sure my gut is in check. Yeah, and that's really like I love like it's. It, you know, I was thinking same thing like with individuals that come in the office. Like the, the tides change so much, and I and I think that one of the biggest signs we we talk about like in, in Chinese medicine, uh, Doctor Axe and I had a lot of conversations about it. Is that if the strength of the stomach, the the stomach chi, and and even like the digestive organs uh, that create enzymes are really imbalanced. If you can get those to where they're functioning together, whether you find a good acupuncturist, a good kinesiologist, find somebody that can help balance that, it, it, then you can, it'll be able to absorb the food that you eat. And I think you have to eat again for the season of life that you're in. And I, and I think that's when people, unfortunately, when they, when they undergo a sickness, they think that, well, again, I can pinch my, hold myself into this. I can only eat that. I'm like, well, if you heal the organs, then, you know, this is where I think goals 
envision come into play. Like this is the thing I love about like um, when you look at your fees, when you look at how you write, it's like when you open up uh, possibilities to individuals, like you can eat to strengthen your body, to fortify your, to accomplish a dream, like you, to accomplish something. And, and many people just, uh, we're, they're still living, to, eating just to, to live instead of like, you know, they, they're not like experiencing life. You know, you can use your food as medicine in that way too. So we're really, hundred oh, percent. I, yeah. I, mean, I find that so much. I mean, there, there's individuals that do um, times where I will put them on a small supplement regimen or so herbal. And then they say, no, I think my body's calling for like more whole foods in this way. And like, I think it's, I love that you brought this up. Any individuals out there that are asking, I guarantee it, they're going to be like, yeah, when I did some kind of juices, or if I did this kind of vegetable raw, I felt worse. And many individuals out there may not, and you, and yes, you've seen this, like, you know, you can have oxalates in there, you can have solanines, you can have different types of protein components within vegetables and some even within fruit and lectins that may not be the, you know, the best for your inflammatory um, uh, processes in your body. So they can expect to see that. I know when they read your information on there and, and all this with your journey, it's taken a really cool turn and not a turn it's all together. But like when you have like different things like skincare and you've had these things come up, do with the, the, the meeting place, like whenever, like now your people are coming to you for all of these things, have you found that your platform is only getting bigger and what, what does that do? Like where, like you're going, sky's the limit, but like, you're like are you doing more speaking, are you doing more to like, to tell about your journey or how, how's this going to like keep playing on? You know, I, I would love, you know, I think like I was saying, like, I, I don't take it lightly having a platform and sharing, even though I don't have that many followers. I mean, there's people that have way more, but the bigger the stage, the bigger the voice. And that would mean that, you know, the more people I can help. Yes. Through my experiences and through my journey. And, you know, I would love that, but it's, it's, you know, like yesterday, this woman reached out to me. I mean, I, every single day people reach out to me, whether it's, you know, someone who has rheumatoid arthritis and has witnessed and I've helped them and inspired them and give them courage that it's going to be okay. Or something like that. Just those little messages where I'm like, oh, like, this is what life is about. Like, in the end of the day, you know, that's really what life is about. Yes, we need to make money and we need to be able to live. But if I'm making people's life better in some way, then I've done my job, you know. Um, that's so good because um, I'm going to talk about, you know, so I want to mention this book that you have, the book you have, but I'm saying this, I, I, don't, I know I'm backtracking a little bit, but encouraging people and many people out there, like when I say goals, like, you know, anybody out there has rheumatoid and like that, be position like you're going um, IVF and you're wanting to have another have a baby and that's to me like individuals out there that probably say well that never could happen like with me like how body my body's sick but you're showing that these things things are possible um, I, I want everybody out there that's going through this and wants to have a baby like to, to hit you up and talk about <laughs> and I, think that- I have had so many I have turned so many women to become mothers because my son is 17 So all my friends ended up having kids afterwards and all of them were like, I don't think I would have had a child if I didn't see like you and your relationship with your son and how amazing it was. So I always joke like all my friends that had babies after me was because I, Oh, I just love being a mom and I love everything about it. So Uh, more babies. babies. I mean, Hey, (laughs) you're, you're, you're rocking it now and you're going to be a good, great second mom. It's going to be awesome. Second time around. It's great. I mean, now with the book Golden Secrets Optimal Health, like uh, when did when did you write this? Was it um, was it a while back or was it just uh, recently? yeah? So oh gosh, this was my literally my second child. This book, um, like I said, I was getting these downloads, so I was I was simultaneously writing this book while I was still writing my blog and while I was birthing the Golden Secrets skincare. So it was like anytime I would get inspired, I would just write, write, write. And this was probably back in, gosh, 2017. I don't, I'm horrible with dates. Mm-hmm. Um, it took me about two years to write because I was doing so many other things. I wasn't just dedicating all my time, but it was such a labor of love. And every time I would write, it was like, I want to share every modality and every single thing in this book 
that has helped me in my life in some way. And getting back to the tuning in part intermittently throughout, I share my story. And then I have reflection pages where I ask you questions. What's your ancestry? What's your blood type? Where do you live? Why do you think you have this ailment? Because your instinct is profound and it might be like, you know what? That one time my dad yelled at me when I was three and he said, you know, something crazy might come out that makes a connection for you. And the entire book, I offer everything that helped me. But the main purpose, again, is to guide you in to find your own path to optimal health. And that is, I mean, I love it that you say, like when people write down, and really when the door was closed in their subconscious, even if it's trapped in the unconscious mind, and they can find the avenue. I think that many times, I know we've seen this, like many times the patients come in that have RA or an autoimmune in- infection. And then um, I'll, you know, I, I try to be as fancy as I can. And I'll, I'll, I'll do like a genetic test and we'll find some vitamin D receptor issues, which helps a lot with healing up with, with autoimmune. And we're like, okay, that's great. But their mind is not focused on that it truly it's like an old trauma and, and in you know chinese medicine we'll see like you know an old trauma we know we talked about it's like it can go into an organ and the organ get dysfunctional and the organ is weak and then the the action of that organ gets a little bit off and then your genetics express themselves the, the i hate to say it the the mutations or the variants and i have to say like over the years like the idea like or not even the idea the fact of having a patient write down what they're feeling through like reading your you know the stories and reading the experiences and see what happens it is truly a powerful thing and for everybody that's listening i i would employ just as jesse has said to write down and try to figure out what goes on inward when you're dealing with any debilitating disease and you're proof that you can thrive in this and i mean dr ax said this is going to be a really good interview and i thought i know it's like with all the things that you've shown i was like you you got a lot of style and so i was just like i was super oh, thank you thank so you. where are they okay let's do this where can they find the book of course on the website but i want to know your website i want to know your your feeds your facebook what is where can they find you yeah so the book you can of course find on my website but on amazon it's available also on kindle and, Aud- and audible Um, and then the golden secrets, you can find all my products, all my blogs, everything else I share. And then Instagram, um, the golden secrets has its own page. And then Jesse golden, um, that's where I'm most active is on Instagram. Jesse golden. It's it's great. I mean, guys, for everybody out there, check out, if you want helpful tips on different aspects of life, there's even parts of her blog that talk about the colors that are around you, uh, the frequencies, the wavelengths of light. And we may think that these are like, oh, that doesn't mean a lot. Like it, it does, especially when you're dealing with different types of ailments in the body. So if you want advice, all things cool, check out (laughs) Jesse Golden, check out the golden secrets. Jesse, Josh, Dr. Axe sends his love. And we really appreciate you sharing your story and uh, giving people the advice and showing where they can come and get your um, your helpful tips. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much. It was such a blessing connecting with you. I'm so grateful. Oh, I'm so glad too. So everybody check her out. And from Dr. Axe Podcast, I'm the co-host, Dr. Motley. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll talk to you soon. This podcast is for information purposes only. Statements and views expressed in this podcast are not medical advice and have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. Opinions of guests are their own, and this podcast does not endorse or accept responsibility for statements made by guests. In some cases, individuals on this podcast may have a direct or indirect financial interest in products or services referred to herein.